Hi, everyone. Welcome to this uh, talk on how to carefully replace thousands of nodes every day. My name is Adrian Trouillot. I'm an engineering manager at Datadog. I lead the uh, compute node lifecycle team. And today I have the uh, pleasure to be speaking with Ryan. Hey, folks. I'm Ryan McNamara. I'm an engineer at Datadog with uh, the same team as Adrian. And I've been doing Kubernetes things for a few years now. Datadog is an observability company. Every hour, we ingest trillions of data points from our customers' applications and infrastructure. To process those data points, uh, we uh, run hundreds of thousands of Kubernetes pods on tens of thousands of nodes in many clusters. And to meet our customers where they are, we run on multiple clouds. Also, to uh, better control the performance and reliability of our platform, and as consistently as possible across cloud providers, uh, we run Kubernetes from scratch. Part of our duties as cluster operators is to replace nodes when needed. And at, at our scale, this happens thousands of times a day. Uh, and we do that without breaking applications. If you use a managed distribution, you may not fully control when nodes need to be replaced, uh, but you are responsible for protecting your workloads when that happens. So today, we'll first explain why nodes need to be replaced, how it's done generally, uh, and more specifically at Datadog. Uh, you'll learn about some of the strategies that we use to uh, protect our workloads when we uh, replace nodes. And we, uh, we hope to uh, start a conversation on turning some of those strategies into uh, Kubernetes enhancements. So there are many reasons to replace nodes. When we uh, started running Kubernetes, we needed a solution uh, to uh, first quickly react to hardware failures, uh, like bad memory, failing disks. Uh, at our scale, that's not so rare. Um, and they don't necessarily break the nodes completely, uh, but they have a negative impact on performance, so we need to do something about it. We also wanted to anticipate VM retirements. Uh, that's when the cloud provider reclaims your uh, virtual machines. Um, and uh, yeah, we don't want those to uh, come as a surprise. Uh, but these days, the main use case by far uh, of the solution that we've built is to upgrade machine images. Uh, we do that for Kubernetes upgrades and also for operating system security, security patches. Uh, as you may have seen this morning uh, in a, a keynote presentation by my colleague Simant and uh, Laurent, uh, we uh, had a good reason to disable unattended upgrades uh, and we uh, exclusively rely on node replacement for operating system patches now. More and more, we also replace nodes um, to use faster and cheaper VMs. Um, so our applications are highly available, and they generally tolerate involuntary disruptions, which is the sudden loss of a node and its pods. Uh, but the, the reasons listed here just occur too frequently uh, to just kill the nodes. So uh, luckily, there's a better way. So you, you may be familiar with some node replacement solutions. Uh, the three major cloud providers uh, automatically upgrade nodes and handle VM retirements with uh, their managed node, uh, node groups and node pools. On AKS and GKE, for node auto repair, uh, they rely on a, an open source project called Node Problem Detector. Uh, and that can run either as a daemon set or as part of machine images. It uh, detects some common problems like bad memory, failing disks, uh, adds a condition on the node status and that condition triggers no replacements. Finally, I'd like to mention Carpenter. Uh, it's a, an alternative to cluster autoscaler on AWS, uh, and that also takes care of no replacements. Uh, importantly, all of those solutions rely on the eviction API to protect your workloads. Uh, Kubernetes doesn't fully handle node lifecycle. It doesn't start nodes, it doesn't stop nodes. That is delegated to the cluster operator. But one thing it does provide is uh, that API as a building block to build upon for to create a node replacement solution. And the eviction API is basically a conditional pod deletion. The uh, eviction API protects pods covered by pod disruption budgets, or PDB for short. Uh, PDB is a, a, a Kubernetes object uh, that you can represent as YAML like this. Uh, it matches pods. Uh, it covers spot ma um, that match a label selector. Um, you can specify a maximum number of unavailable pods uh, among those covered. And while enough pods are available, any one of them can be deleted. 
you can also specify a minimum number of available pods or use percentages instead of integers. Available uh, means that all of the pods containers uh, pass their readiness probes. Readiness probes are defined in a pod spec. Uh, they can be HTTP calls, uh, TCP calls, gRPC commands, and they're executed by the kubelet. And the results of those probes uh, sort of cascade down to the PDB status. The primary use of readiness probe is actually for service availability. Uh, um, when, so when a pod is ready, its IP is registered as an endpoint of services and sort of reused as a healthiness indicator for pod disruption budgets. And we'll see how that is sort of limiting in a way uh, later. So to replace a node uh, gracefully, a solution must implement four basic steps. Um, cordon the node, evict the pods together, that's called draining the nodes. Uh, 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 terminate the old VM and start a new one. Uh, you, uh, you may want to start the new VM earlier to uh, speed up scheduling as we'll see later. To cordon a node, you mark it unscalable, that's a spec field, uh, or, uh, or you taint it so a new pods can land on it. Then you evict the pods and that's a conditional deletion uh, protected by pod disruption budget, as I said. Uh, if there is no PDB, uh, careful, that just uh, the pod is simply deleted. Uh, it's uh, an unprotected deletion. The, uh, the pod disruption budget uh, status uh, is a reflection of the readiness probes from the uh, pod's containers. And going back to the eviction, uh, if enough pods are available, the eviction can proceed into a deletion. The containers are terminated. Um, and um, typically, the deployment or stateful set controller or any controller that owns the pods will uh, recreate pods immediately. So when a node is empty, you've evicted all the pods, uh, the, the node replacement solution can terminate the VM. Uh, that stops the kubelet. And there's a component called clock controller manager uh, which is a cloud-specific Kubernetes plugin or add-on that detects that the VM is gone and it deletes the node. Uh, interestingly, uh, Carpenter has a sort of an alternative uh, way to do this. Uh, it uh, deletes the nodes and the termination of uh, VMs is a finalizer on the nodes. Then or earlier, the solution could start a new VM that starts a kubelet, it registers as a node, and the scheduler sees the node and can bind the pod to it containers can start, et cetera. So note the time gap between the new pods creation and uh, their scheduling in this diagram. The, uh, so th that's why the, it's sometimes uh, useful to uh, start a new node before draining the old one. However, that's not always necessary. The new pods could find uh, some room on existing nodes to be bin packed. So I've mentioned a few examples of node replacement solutions that you may be familiar with. I've explained how they generally work. Uh, and I'll briefly talk about uh, the uh, solution that we built at Datadog. Uh, for more details, I invite you to watch an episode of Datadog On that I recorded recently with another colleague of mine called Dave, uh, David Bank. But in short, uh, we first considered using node problem, node problem detector, but we, uh, we already have a daemon set that collects health data about nodes, and that's the Datadog agent. Uh, so our node problem detector uh, is, uh, simply runs as a controller and transforms um, Datadog monitors into node conditions. Uh, in our solution, any reason to replace a node is transcribed as a node condition. To, uh, to drain the nodes that have conditions, we initially used a tool called um, Drano by Planet Labs, but we ended up uh, writing our own adding some uh, node lifecycle hooks that Ryan will discuss later. Um, from the very beginning, cluster autoscaler uh, has been a key component of the solution uh, for any scale up or scale down, including node replacements. And uh, finally, we added a component that we call the disruption budget manager that we use to enhance the eviction API and pod disruption budgets. So at this point, I'd like to emphasize the main keyword uh, of this talk's title, and that's carefully. Uh, to drain thousands of nodes every day, we need velocity, uh, but more importantly, we need to be careful not to break applications. And that is true at any scale. 
So, uh, so let's have a look at some careful strategies. As I said in the introduction, our platform supports hundreds of thousands of pods, and we care about most of them. Um, but when we started this project, we, uh, we quickly realized that uh, not all workloads came with, their P with PDBs. Um, so, and without PDBs, or pod disruption budgets, evictions are unprotected deletion. So, so we needed to enforce PDBs. And so as with any enforcement uh, issue in infrastructure, uh, we could have added checks uh, in CI, an admission, bugged our users, uh, but instead, it's always better, we think, to just do the work for the users. So, uh, so we create PDBs by default if they're missing. For each workload, if, the, the, if a custom PDB is not provided, we create one with max unavailable equals one. That is the safest default, and it's actually fast enough in most cases. Now, remember that uh, PDBs select pods using label selectors, uh, and we realized that if you try to use some of the existing pod labels, you can end up with overlapping PDBs. Uh, so when a pod matches two PDBs, the Cube API server uh, doesn't know which one to use. Uh, it's a configuration error and denies the, uh, the eviction. So to avoid PDB overlaps, um, for our default PDBs, we label the pods uh, with their deployment or stateful set or any other controllers a unique identifier, that's a metadata field. And we select the label in the PDBs. Uh, so users can still create custom PDBs, and uh, in that case, we still monitor for overlaps so they don't block our node replacement campaigns. Now I'd like to talk about the readiness probe and uh, how it's not expressive enough for disruption budgets. As I said, the, the primary use of the readiness probe is to tell when pods are ready to uh, accept traffic. When a pod is ready, its IP is registered as an endpoint of a service. So, and they're reused for, to express uh, disruption budgets in terms of available pods. And tr to replace nodes, we need non-zero budgets in general. But there are circumstances when disruptions should be delayed and at the same critical time, uh, all pods should receive traffic. So we can't use the readiness probe to pilot the budget. Let me give you some examples. Um, uh, an application is under pressure. At that point, losing a pod uh, could push it over the edge. Or an application is undergoing maintenance, uh, an upgrade, or any other type of operation. And at that point, losing a pod could uh, disturb the operation or there's an incident ongoing. It may or may not be related to the application. Uh, you don't know yet. Um, but evicting pods, removing nodes, uh, at that time could actually delay the investigation. It could remove evidence, uh, or it could make things worse. So to deal with those situations, uh, we dynamically set disruption budgets. In particular, we reconcile them with Datadog monitors and uh, an internal distributed lock system that we have. But any third party state could do. For incidents, uh, because we don't want to uh, update all PDBs at once, we, uh, we take advantage of the fact that uh, evictions are a pod sub-resource. And so as a, a, a Kubernetes API server pod, uh, resource, uh, uh, evictions can be intercepted at admission uh, using a validation webhook. And so uh, during some incidents, we uh, deny evictions at admission. So I've talked about how to better protect your um, workloads from evictions, and uh, Ryan will now discuss some ways to, uh, to optimize drains. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, so as Adrian mentioned, Kubernetes delegates node lifecycle management completely to cluster operators. Uh, if you compare this to something like pods, where Kubernetes is able to provide things like pre-stop, post-stop hooks, uh, Kubernetes there actually has complete control over the lifecycle. But for the case of nodes, they're just a reflection of unowned external state, uh, namely virtual machines. Uh, so for this reason, uh, we've had to create our own node lifecycle hooks to make node scale down more graceful. So here's the problem. Uh, we have 
uh, this distribution for pod scheduling latency when pods need a scale up in order to be rescheduled. Uh, so you can see that the P50 is about a little over two minutes and the P99 is five minutes. And this isn't terrible, but for our applications and just to make uh, it more graceful, uh, we can do better than that. So to solve this problem, we do what we call node pre-provisioning. So here's a diagram explaining what happens without pre-provisioning. So we'll have a drain controller that will come and decide to drain a node, and it will evict all of the pods on the nodes, and they'll be deleted. Uh, and then you can see that the cube controller manager is creating uh, replacement pods. But depending on the state of the cluster, these pods may or may not be able to schedule right away. They might require a node scale up. So what we do is, before we evict any pods, we create what we call a set of fake pods. And so the idea is that these fake pods are representative of the pods that we're about to evict. And so what that means is that once these pods are scheduled, we can have high confidence that if we were to delete them and reschedule all the pods that are actually currently running, uh, that they would be able to schedule uh, pretty much immediately or as fast as the cube scheduler can schedule them. And in practice, what this means is we have uh, scheduling times that go from minutes, like I showed on the previous slide, down to just seconds. So after the pods are scheduled, the cluster autoscaler will scale up if it's needed. Uh, once we see that they're all, uh, all of the fake pods are scheduled, we can delete all of them. We can start evicting the pods, and then they'll be scheduled uh, more or less right away. Um, I say that they'll probably be scheduled because the state of pending pods on a Kubernetes cluster is relatively dynamic. So it could be the case that there's some other scale up happening at the same time, or there's a set of node drains happening. But if we do this for multiple node drains that are happening concurrently, what we'll get is the sum of the resources required. And so we'll be able to schedule, uh, say there's two nodes currently draining, we'll be able to schedule all of the pods that are re replacing the pods from those two nodes. The next uh, node drain hook that we have is about persistent volume claims. Uh, so at Datadog, we use local persistent volumes. And suffice to say, we do this for two reasons, performance and cost. And unlike remote volumes you might be more familiar with, uh, local PVs and their associated PVCs are bound to a node tightly until they are deleted. And when you delete them, it's a representation of actually throwing that data away. Um, so until we get rid of a node, the PVC associated with it and uh, the local disk uh, will persist. So what we have here is we have pod A and a PVC A that are coupled together. Uh, when we evict and delete pod A, uh, PVC A continues existing. The stateful set controller will create a replacement pod B, but this pod B will have no PVC that it can actually use because the node that the PVC A is on is uh, cordoned. So the fix is quite simple. Uh, when we evict uh, in our drain controller uh, pod A, we simply delete the PVC associated with it. And you can see why we care so much that our evictions are protected, because like I mentioned, this is potentially a destructive action. We're going to lose uh, the persistent volume uh, for this local node. And this is fine because our databases are set to handle losing a single uh, database replica. So once, uh, once the PVC is deleted, the stateful set controller can go ahead and create pod B. And what will happen is the cube scheduler will see the new PVC and will schedule the pod. The local volume provisioner, which runs as a daemon set on nodes, will be able to provision a local PV that this pod will be able to use. Uh, it's worth noting that before Kubernetes 1.27, the stateful set controller create of pod, or sorry, of PVCB uh, would not actually happen automatically. Uh, one of our team members, Raul, contributed uh, an upstream fix uh, so that the stateful set controller would look at missing PVCs at all phases of life cycles for stateful set pods and not just when stateful set pods are being created. Our last drain hook is a bit more of a generic one, and it allows applications to decide what logic they want to perform when nodes are being drained. So the API for this is similar in spirit to how the pod readiness gate API works. Just for a review, 
Uh, there you have an external controller that decides when a pod is ready, and it does this by updating the status of a pod uh, to just uh, open the gate and say that the pod is in fact ready. So what we do for uh, pod eviction gates is we annotate, the drain controller annotates the pod as a candidate. It's up to the app controller, it's running as a controller, to notice this and then trigger any logic that's associated with it. So the contract here is that the pod is about to go away. And so this is an opportunity for the app controller to really do uh, whatever kind of logic it wants to do to smooth this transition. So perhaps the current replica is a leader and we want to preemptively transition the leader to a new replica. Perhaps the replica is reading from a shard and we want to redistribute that shard to other replicas. Uh, you can imagine snapshots, other examples. Once whatever the app controller needs to do is finished, uh, the app controller will annotate the pod as being done. And then at that time, the drain controller uh, can evict uh, the pod and proceed. So this is a recurrent theme. We have uh, something that we're doing to make scale down more graceful. We don't have a guarantee that we'll be able to do this, but when we can, it is a bit uh, less of a burden on our applications. For our last topic, I'd like to talk about recent, ongoing, and some possible changes to eviction and PDBs in Kubernetes. So evicting and deleting unhealthy pods is very important to us. It's how we recover from degradation, uh, and it's important that we are able to do that with the scale that we run at. So here we have uh, two deployments or stateful sets, and they're running with our default PDB, where we set max on available to one. And you can see that the blue pods are ready and the gray pods are not ready. So the question is, uh, when you try to evict these pods, which ones will succeed and which won't? So prior to Kubernetes 1.20, uh, evicting the unready pod in the left example would fail. And simply the logic was the PDB says max unavailable of one, there's an unavailable pod, and so the eviction fails. After Kubernetes 1.20, the default, chain, the default behavior changed uh, to what's called uh, if healthy budget. And what that means is that the check is done such that after the eviction, as long as there's only one max event, max unavailable, the delete will go through. So that's great for us, and that is the setting that we use. Uh, in Kubernetes 1.26, uh, there was an additional uh, option added called always allow, and it's exactly what the name says. It just means that any time a pod is unready, you're able to evict it. Um, and this makes sense in some cases. However, this is not the option that we use. So then I'll give a couple examples as to why. Uh, so when a pod is not ready, you don't actually have a strong guarantee that it's not doing something useful. So you could imagine that in the right-hand case where we have two not ready pods, the first pod is doing useful work, it's continuing to operate, and perhaps the second unready pod is actually having a problem. Um, if we evict, oh, and, and the first pod is unready because the kubelet is simply not able to uh, heartbeat to the API server, suppose. So if we evict the first pod, then we're actually going to create an issue where there wasn't one already. And so we want to take the sort of pessimistic approach and assume that this is uh, the way to go. Um, the situation gets more important when you consider that these pods might be having local data, like I mentioned earlier. So in that case, if we uh, suppose that one of the pods had corrupted data, the other one is in the same state where the kubelet can't heartbeat. If you evict that pod, then you're going to have two replicas that now have uh, their data effectively deleted. And so you might have data loss depending on the database that you're using. So here's a review of some suggestions that we've made in this talk. We talked about uh, a disruption probe to decouple service routability and voluntary disruption handling. Uh, we talked about default PDBs, which is a simplifying assumption to assume that uh, all evictions will be protected. And I went over some node lifecycle hooks that make node draining uh, more efficient. For our last idea or proposal, I'd like to talk about voluntary disruptions and whether or not they should always respect PDBs. Uh, spoiler alert, the answer I'm going to propose is yes with some qualifiers. So pod preemption occurs when there is a high priority pending pod and a low priority 
running pod. And suppose that this pending pod can't be scheduled anywhere and is configured with a priority class that is configured with preempt lower priority, then in that case, uh, the cube scheduler is actually going to delete the existing low priority running pod. And this is an unprotected delete, so for all of the reasons I mentioned earlier, this is problematic for us. And indeed, we had an internal incident related to this. So what happened was we rolled out a new version of a daemon set where we slightly increased the resources of it. Now, for most nodes that uh, this daemon set change rolled out to, everything was fine. We were just able to increase the resources slightly. But for some uh, nodes, this actually wound up squeezing effectively uh, some pods off of the nodes. Uh, and so when you do this times 1,000 nodes, you start to run into problems. A lot of our applications were fine and could handle losing a single replica. But in some cases, we would take down one replica for an application, and then we'd move to another node and take down another replica of that application. And that's where we started to have problems. Um, so there's a Kubernetes enhancement plan uh, already in progress that's been approved uh, to provide an option to guarantee uh, respecting PDBs to use eviction when preempting pods. Um, by default, uh, currently, uh, it's done best effort, but it's not a guarantee like I mentioned. So the next case is taint-based eviction. So the name says eviction, but it's actually deletion. Um, and the way that taint-based eviction works is that a node will acquire a no-execute taint the most common one that we see is unreachable. Like I mentioned a couple times, the, say the kubelet is unable to heartbeat to the API server, it'll get a unreachable no execute taint. After some time, uh, the, the pod either does not tolerate the taint or no longer tolerates the taint. Its toleration seconds has elapsed. And at that time, the node controller in the cube controller manager is going to delete the pod. And this is again problematic for all of the reasons we've mentioned before. So the, prob the proposal then is to have some configurability options to have t uh, taint-based eviction respect PDBs and use eviction. Um, and if you allow yourself to imagine a little bit, you could imagine also using taint-based eviction in order to drain. So it could potentially replace uh, the drain controller that we have been talking about. And that would be great for us because it would allow us to you know, maintain fewer controllers and just kind of stay more in line with default. Uh, Kubernetes behavior. Uh, this is a bit of an open-ended idea. It probably requires something like promoting uh, conditions to no execute taints and probably some configuration about when you give up trying to evict and just move on to delete. So here's a non-exhaustive list of other places where currently deletion happens, where we think eviction could make sense. Uh, so we talked about the first two. Uh, the third one is node pressure eviction. So this occurs when a kubelet does not have enough resources and needs to start getting rid of pods on the node in order to make, uh, in order to guarantee that it can continually operate correctly. Uh, so this is probably a case where you can't always go to eviction because the node needs to reclaim resources uh, immediately, uh, but it probably could make sense to uh, start with eviction and maybe move on to deletion again. Uh, and the last one is uh, the case of rollouts. So for example, when you roll out a deployment, uh, there's an update strategy associated with that deployment. And that's actually completely separate from uh, pod disruption budgets. So you could specify that you're OK with uh, losing two pods when you're doing a deployment rollout, and your PDB would only say one. And in fact, what you'd see is you'll have two pods deleted. And that's because uh, deployment rollouts and controller rollouts in general use deletion instead of eviction. So if you take something away, uh, it would, I would like it for, to be to consider using eviction instead of deletion. Uh, we find it to be a very simplifying assumption for us. It's guaranteed to be safe. Of course, it's not actually guaranteed. There are some qualifiers. Uh, but we think it's something that's useful for us and could be useful for the community in general as well. So thank you very much for coming to our talk. Uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions now. And if you see us around, feel free to talk to us. Hi. 
Uh, can you talk a little bit about the differences between Max Unavailable in the deployment API versus um, PDB? Can you repeat the question? Sorry. Um, can you talk a little about the difference between Max Unavailable in the deployment API versus using an actual PDB explicitly? Sure. So yeah. for deployments have rollout strategies, and you can specify like a Max Surge and a Max Unavailable. Uh, and so basically it's just a completely separate track from what the PDBs specify. So when you're doing a deployment rollout, the deployment update strategy is respected. And then when you're doing evictions, uh, the pod disruption budget is respected. So they're just two completely, they're, they're divorced, which is surprising. Um, when you guys are doing high volume node replacements, how uh, quickly are you comfortable going? Like how do you base the amount of nodes you're replacing at one time by like a static number or a percentage of your total node pool? Or like how, how fast are you guys comfortable going during high volume replacements? Um, so we go as fast as needed. Uh, so we have, basically we, uh, we have a configuration by condition uh, and some conditions are more urgent than others. Uh, and so if we need to go fast, we go as fast as the PDBs allow us. Uh, and uh, we also have a, a mechanism of uh, back pressure from the cluster autoscaler so that we don't um, you know, put too much scale-up pressure on the system. Um, I like that you guys are doing the default PDB stuff. Is that in reaction to people creating poorly configured PDBs or in the past? Or what do you guys do? to mitigate that risk? Yeah, so I think beyond poorly configured PDBs, it's more that by default there just is no PDB. And when there is no PDB, an eviction is the exact same as deletion. Um, and so a lot of our, you know, this is basically just a burden that we can take away from our app maintainers and just do it for them. And we found that like the conservative default, well, the most conservative default is max unavailable of one. And we found that that works pretty well. I hope you don't mind me cheating and asking two questions. Uh, but the first one was, can you elaborate a little bit on the fake pods? Are they just dummy pods, or are they actually some kind of CRD? Um, no, they're, they're actually just pods that run uh, containers that do nothing. OK. And the other one was, you had talked about not trusting Kubernetes reporting a, no, a pod is not ready, that it might be mm -hmm. doing something. Mm -hmm. Is there any thoughts or plans around getting to the point where you can trust that, or are we just sticking with that assumption? I think you have to stick with that assumption. I mean, bugs, whatever. I mean, there's, it's entirely possible that Kubelet just has died and is not going to be talking to the API server anymore. In that case, all of the pods on that node are going to be marked as unready. But who knows what they're actually doing? So I, I think it's, I don't think there's really any way around it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my question is around the pod engineers' kits. So how do you manage it in a controlled environment, like when you are not having access to patch the resources? Not access to which kind of resources? Uh, patching a pod readiness gate. Like if I want to update my pod readiness gate, how can I do it in a controlled environment? You're talking about pod updates? Pod readiness gates. Oh, pod readiness gates, sorry. Um, yeah, so I guess I'm not seeing how it, how it ties into node draining. So pod readiness gates are a way to uh, basically have some controller that declares when pods are ready beyond normal Kubernetes mechanisms. Um, and for us, that just ties into pod readiness. We don't look to see if a pod readiness gate is passed or not. We just check that the pod is ready, which is, and pod readiness gate is included in that. Okay. Does that you. answer your question? Okay. Uh, one question I had is uh, we've seen issues when pod disruption budgets are misconfigured and because of which drains are not properly done. Uh, some inexperienced developers or inexperienced administrators do sometimes delete, delete the pods, which generally doesn't cause any issues. But can you talk about some nuances between uh, the difference between eviction and deletion when uh, we are, what, like what's exactly the difference between the two operations? The, um, when it works exactly like? Can you repeat the very end of your, what you said? So, yeah, can you talk about the nuances between uh, a pod deletion and a pod eviction and uh, what, what are the failure scenarios that we can see when we are deleting instead of uh, evicting? Yeah, we, so we, uh, we, we basically advocate for 
always evicting unless uh, the, uh, the the part disruption budget doesn't allow you to uh, um, you know uh, remove the part that you want to remove. But most of the time, like we um, like the the there's little reason to go um, you know, to go to go in and uh, and like manually evict or delete a pod. Uh, that's um, so, but do you want to add something? Sure. I guess the way we think about it is like the first step is eviction, and there's really not a concern with the way that we run with eviction. It's supposed to be always safe, and so that's kind of a starting point. If that's not going to work because uh, maybe you lost all of your nodes at the same time, uh, and you have like work your workloads running on multiple nodes and you lose all of the nodes, well, then it's like going to be maintenance and you're probably going to need someone to come in and look at it and start manually deleting things, try to get things to a good state. But like by default, eviction for us is just safe. So we try to default to that. Yeah. If, if you're deleting, be sure of yourself, right? Like, I mean, mm -hmm. you have to have a good reason. So is, is deleting like a hard delete rather than, and eviction is more graceful? Is that... Yeah, eviction is more graceful because there are additional checks uh, and delete will just stop the termination uh, process of the pod. Uh, so um, it's uh, irreversible, uh, and so once the pods start being terminating, there are a few things that are called on, on the containers, like pre-stop hooks, uh, et cetera, uh, but it's irreversible. And after the termination grace period, the, the, the containers are killed. So like, one, like if, you, if you start to delete a pod, you have to be sure of yourself. Got it. Thank you. <clears throat> Something that I... Uh, was interested in hearing a little bit more about at the beginning of the talk was you said you had disabled unattended upgrades. Um, can you go a little bit more into like what happened and why? Uh, we're, we're having the same fight uh, at my company and you know, I'm curious to have yeah. some more ammo in my, chain, in my uh, corner. So it sounds like you did not attend the keynote uh, this morning. <laughs> <laughs> No comment. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a, a great blog post series uh, written by Laurent who, uh, who, uh, and Hemant who uh, presented the keynote uh, this morning about what happened uh, with um, unattended upgrades. Um, but it's basically, yeah, a, a, like a combination of factors uh, that made us realize that we did not want to uh, rely on unattended upgrades. PDB being a lagging indicator, which you pointed out, um, like we have suffered through the same problem as well. Um, do you think the pod eviction gate can help you solve the problem? Can you move closer to the microphone, please? Sure. The PDB being a lagging indicator, that is something which we have faced in production as well. Um, do you have a solution which you have thought about implementing? And uh, can pod eviction gate help there? And our second question is that: Have you, uh, have you, are you in discussion with upstreaming the pod eviction gate? I guess the way I think about it is that it sort of has to be a lagging indicator. Um, I mean, it's entirely possible that right when you go to evict, there's two of your pods going with the max unavailable one. There's two of your pods that are immediately unready, but it's basically a raise condition as to whether or not you tried to evict before or after that happened. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Do you have anything else to add to that? Uh, to, your, to your second point, uh, yes, uh, we're making contact with uh, stream teams to discuss some of the ideas that we have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, how do you guys work with long running pods and batches? Do you like pack them into certain nodes, certain clusters? Do you, what do you do to address that and your goals of replacing nodes? To, uh, to do what in batches? Like Long if you have pods, pods oh. that have to run for four hours or they're useless, how do you guys address you know longer running pods that you can't interrupt for a long period oh. of time? Oh yeah, yeah. So jobs basically yeah. bat batch workloads. Um, so we uh, we um, in a way we're lucky <laughs> in that our uh, batch workloads most of them. Um, run, uh, have a reasonable 
runtime. Uh, so we take the uh, simplifying assumption that uh, we don't evict them and we just wait for them to run to completion. Uh, and so when, 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 the, when replacing the node is not that urgent, uh, that's okay. Another thing that we do is when we're deciding what node to drain next, we do a simulation to see what we expect would happen. And so that's not like a guarantee of what will happen, but that puts us away from evicting, or sorry, for draining nodes that have these long running jobs first. And so we, we do other nodes first, and then hopefully by the time we get to that one, the job is done or closer to being done. So that's something that helps. Uh, hey, Sean from Uber. So we are, uh, I think the current design uh, for node pressure eviction, that one is, uh, doesn't respect to the uh, PDB. Do you have any context? Like, are we going to uh, support PDB in terms of uh, node pressure? I'm sorry, I did not hear the end. Can you move closer to the microphone, please? Oh, okay. So uh, I'm talking about node pressure eviction. For example, a okay. node uh, run out of memory or you like, like mm -hmm. you set a memory threshold to, let's say, 80%, uh, something like that. So whenever the node uh, consume more memory than that, it will start, kubelet will start the uh, eviction, right? That, that a kind of eviction doesn't respect uh, PDB right now. Yep. Have you ever seen any issue and do you have any context about the discussion or proposal around that? Yeah, so, um, so, so luckily this uh, doesn't happen very often, and when it does happen, it's often because of a, of, um, you know, a misconfiguration uh, of, uh, of um, basically uh, people uh, re re asking for too much memory on the node, for example, uh, on, and not requesting it, or, or like using too much but not requesting it, that's what I mean. Um, so it's, it's isolated, so, but it, it is, as, like it can theoretically uh, you know, break the contract of the PDB because it's not respected, right? Um, so, uh, so we th we think that um, it would be a safe change to uh, best effort respect PDBs for node pressure eviction, uh, which is not the case at the moment. So, uh, node pressure eviction is not a big deal uh, for your experience. I don't think that we've actually seen a case where it caused an issue. Like we had a specific case where like, oh, we, we had node pressure, we evicted this pod. Oh, if only we had evicted this pod, things would have been better. I don't know that we've seen a specific case. I think it's, mm -hmm. just, uh, it's just another thing that you could imagine happening. Okay, but like what, what's the reasonable uh, like host memory eviction threshold for your experience? I don't know what do we use. Honestly, uh, I don't remember exactly what we use as, as a threshold, uh, but but it's I think it's important to uh, to be f like not only like set a reasonable threshold, but I think m probably more importantly, it's important to reserve enough for the system in Kubelet. And so that's that's a sp separate setting, and we do that, and that is like separate depending on the size of the VM type. Okay. Cool. <laughs> All right, thank you very much.